Martin's going to give us a bit of a talk on HF contesting, and then Richard's going to give us a talk on the VHF and above contesting. So, without further ado, over to Martin. <laughs> Thank you, Justin, and uh, welcome to the presentation. Um, the first picture up there is just to demonstrate my qualifications for talking to you about HF contesting. Those are plaques for winning uh, international awards of one sort or another. First rule of any contesting, really, is BIC, bum in chair. The more time you spend operating, the higher your score. It's not a linear relationship, but it is a relationship. And very often the difference between two stations at the end of the contest might be just a couple of contacts or a couple of multipliers. Make sure you're comfortable for long periods. Not too soft a chair, so you fall asleep. Um, and it, it's quite good to stand up some of the time. Make sure the environment is good. One of the better investments I made at my VK5GN contest station was an air conditioner for the shack. Review your diet. Avoid anything stodgy and fatty foods, which will make you go to sleep. If caffeine keeps you awake, use Use caffeine. I like chocolate, but you know, that's me. Bathroom breaks, keep food and liquid in intake to a minimum. You don't need to go out to the loo or too often. I'm going to tell you about some people who made some very large scores later on. And one of those people never leaves the shack. He drinks from the bottle and then he fills the bottle. Um, well, I'm never sure quite, but there we go. Use headset or a boom microphone. Never, ever, ever use a hand microphone for contesting. You will get RSI of the hand or something equally as awful. Planning for what you're going to do. Read the rules. Read the rules again. Because contest committees have a habit of changing things from year to year. And I've been caught out myself a couple of times when they've changed the time of the contest and I've come on and said, oh, why is everybody, they're not supposed to be on for another half hour? Okay. Now, different operators do their planning differently. Some plan every quarter hour, what band they're going to be on, what time, you know, where they're going to point the beam, blah, blah, blah. I'm more reactive. I like to listen for a few weeks before the contest and get a feel for how the bands sound. And I'll speak a little more about that later. I then make a decision about where I'm going to start, and then I have some triggers along the way. If my running rate goes below 40, now running is when you call CQ and people are calling you. So if I'm making less than 40 contacts in the hour, I start reviewing where I'm at. Either I'm on the wrong band, or if I'm on the right band, maybe I should be moving around and searching and pouncing. I've developed the skill of tuning around so that I can do about 60 an hour tuning around. And I know from my previous listing to the bands whether the band is opening, closing, opening to a particular place, turn the beam, can hear the change in noise, and that's where it's opening to. It's hard to describe that feel. Um, I've, I've been in contests where I've been contesting away on 20 metres and I feel like I'm uh, Harry Potter or somebody sitting up in the sky looking down on the world and where signals are coming from and how strong they are and I'm just sensing how that is happening. You can forecast band conditions using software but I just find that my, my ears are better. You need to learn about propagation. Now that applies very much to international contests, but also to local contests, to our RD contests, for example. 
there's a, a blind spot between where the ground wave finishes and the first sky wave lands. Now, you fill up, if you can fill up that gap, there are signals to be made because sometimes that gap, sitting in that gap, is Melbourne. And you need to be able to work Melbourne. So the trick there is to have a thing called NVIS, near vertical incidence, something or other, um, which will help you to go straight up and straight down rather than up and down in an angle. Here's, for international contesting, here's a Hobart-centred map of the world. So we're here. And it looks quite good, really, because everything's nicely spread around, you know. Just easily go from one to the other. They're a long way away, but they're spread around. But if you take a look at the map centred on London, or in this case, Los Angeles, you suddenly find that Australia is sort of at the ends of the universe. Not quite as bad as New Zealand, which is spread out like a thin line over there. But what to remember about this is when you're operating on the band and you're hearing that W6 calling CQ and you call him and he doesn't even hear you. You call again, he doesn't even hear you. And the reason would be that he's probably working Japan. Now, if he beams directly to Japan, and he's got something like a four element beam, which is about a 60 degree angle, then if you come back 30 degrees here, you're not in his passband of his antenna. He's running three or four times as much power as you are. So, you're already a few dBs down because of power. You're going to be a few more dBs down because you're coming in on the side of his beam. And what you've got to hope is that the guy has enough brains to set his beam so that he's just got Japan, and that'll give him a chunk of Australia. Then what we in VK7 have to hope is that somebody in VK4 works him, <laughs> And so he's, he has trouble with the VK4, so he spins the beam a little bit, and then you jump in. But you've got to have those sort of things in mind before you do, you're really successful at working some of these stations. We have the advantage in VK7 that we're rare, onto an operating technique. Remember that this is one of the very few sports in the world where the blind novice plays on exactly the same field as the expert. So it's like us driving our little sedan car on the same racetrack as a Formula One machine. And if you think the Formula One driver is going to be really tolerant of what you're doing, you're kidding yourself. And the basic rule on, on contests is the station calling CQ dictates how it's played. So if they're running fast, then respond the same way. CQ VK7 GN, KW5 USA. KW5 USA, 5930. 5904, VK7 GN. So that would be a, a sort of rapid exchange. Now, and sometimes in the RD contest particularly, which is a sort of build as a friendly contest, and it's, it's one I go on principally to find out who's still alive. <laughs> um, so, you know, the CQ might be doing this kind of thing. Yeah. Hi, Bob, you're 5930. Now, if the CQ does that, you can go back and give your name and be a bit slow. But be aware that the CQ station may change its tune. Because I'll be, I'll be operating like that, and then the pileup of stations calling me gets bigger, then I'm going to flash, bang, and I'm going to be doing finite 30, 30. Now, calling CQ, the main problem is finding a clear frequency in any large contest. Now, 
it's nice when we have the, uh, things like the Oceania contest where we can call CQ and the others shouldn't really be calling CQ, they should be looking for us. Um, phonetics. Use the standard phonetic alphabet. It's in all the handbooks. Don't get clever with it. But have a, have a, uh, a secondary one. Now, the standard one for my call is Golf November. But golf has a problem that it's soft and it gets lost. So my alternate is Germany, Norway. And it's amazing how many people who don't get it first time, and I use the Germany, Norway, come back and give it me as Germany, November. Yeah, so, you know, you're communicating. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to communicate. Now, let's go back to finding a clear frequency. Be aware that what sounds like a clear frequency may not actually be a clear frequency. There may be somebody operating on that frequency in the other part of the world who's dropping a huge signal into the part of the world that you want to work. So you can call CQ till the cows come home and nobody's hearing you. And it is possible to operate a frequency with two people using the same frequency, working the same zone. I had an example of this on 10 metres some number of years ago when 10 metres was wide open. And I was banging away, working quite fast, but it was clear there was something else on the frequency. Didn't matter, I was still keeping going quite fast. Everything was going well. And then, the, I was working Europeans, and then a station started to appear within the gaps of the Europeans. And eventually it turned out it was K1AR, who's a friend of mine over in America. And we were both operating on the same frequency and had been for about two hours. We both made something like two or 300 contacts while we were both using the same frequency. So it can happen, it can happen well, and we just sort of each moved a little bit either way and got on with it. Um, so don't assume that when a station suddenly appears on your frequency that he's trying to pinch the frequency. He might have been there just as long as you have. And never, ever get into a frequency fight. It is a complete waste of time. Neither of you are going to win. So just move. Um, there are some tricks you can use. One of the things not to do is go on a round frequency. So 14200. I mean, you hear them all the time in normal conversation. That's where they go. 14200, 14205, 14210. Me, I never do. I don't think my radio will operate on a round frequency. <laughs> um, what I do is I go on to something like 14277575. And I call CQ there. If I don't get any joy, I move up a couple of cases, a couple of cycles. Not very much, just, just a smidgen. And I keep moving up a smidgen until I get to another round number. Which means, forget it. <laughs> You're not going to get a frequency in here. But very often you do, because if you can just slide in that gap between the QRM, and that's what you're trying to do with just moving a little bit. It doesn't need much, because these days the filters in radios are very, very good. So you can slip outside the filter and they can hear you again. Uh, Fred Lorne always says K3ZO. He said, if you can't stand the noise, get out because you will not have a clear frequency. If every amateur in the world comes on, there's no clear frequencies. Um, and if you get stuck, you can always go right at the extremes of the band. That's another way to find a frequency. Spotting networks have really made a mess of all this because it now has introduced an element of luck. If you get spotted and continually spotted, then you can hold a frequency into Europe, no problem. But if you don't get spotted, somebody else will be doing it. Um, so S&P, we talked about searching, searching and pouncing and CQ. Um, S&P is by nature slower, but you may come across more multipliers that way. On a normal day, the reasonable band opening on SSB, I can get about 60 stations 
an hour into the log, whereas running I can do about 120 per hour. My top rate has been 240. Now, what are the best rates in the world? Okay, high power SSB, 407 per hour. Low power SSB, 390 per hour. QRP, 289 per hour. Here's, here's, here's why, here's how. This is minute number four from 8 Papa 5 Alpha. Right? Those are all minute four. There's 10 contacts in one minute. But look where they all are. W, Canada, W, 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 W. They all speak real good English and they're all aware of what's going on with the contest. Now, if you try and do that into Europe, good luck. In 1999, EA8BH with N5TJ as op scored 10,253 QSOs. That is an average over 48 hours of 213 contacts per hour. That's the average contacts. He's one of the guys, by the way, that uses the bottle two ways. Um, he, never leaves the, he never leaves the rig. Uh, CN2CO won in 2018 with 6177 QSOs. And I put those up just to show the difference between good conditions and bad conditions. Which contest are you talking about? CQ Worldwide. Um, now, let's be realistic about Zone 30. We're at the back end of the universe. And VK7 is even further at the back end of the universe. But let's see what we can do. VK5GN in 1999 averaged 61 QSOs per hour over the whole contest. That still is the Zone 30 all-band high-power record. Um, again, in 2000, I did pretty much the same, 59.75. In 2002, again, 59.9. So it seems as though that's kind of the, the limit. There I had uh, monoband beams at 60 feet on all the bands. And I had a 100 foot mast for 160 and blah, blah, blah. 100 foot, radio, 100, 100 foot radials, whatever. So if you want to operate in VK, zone 29 is better than zone 30. Northern zone 30 is mostly better than southern zone 30. VK9 any trumps all with a good operator. VK7 is last on the list and probably last on the list anywhere in the world. So why contest for VK7? Well, for me it's fun. You also can get a million and one pieces of paper. I got two folders of those. They're all certificates. We want to comment about 5.9 and all that. There's, there's a debate from time to time about giving realistic reports. Now, I'll give you a realistic report, but outside the contest. I'll plug in an attenuator and you can do your test and I'll tell you what the differences are. Otherwise, you'll need to know the calibration of my S-meter. You'll need to know whether I'm reading it accurately or not. You'll also need to, to know... Um, what my antennas are, whether I'm using a preamplifier or not. In other words, the so-called realistic reports are totally unrealistic. To do the job properly, you've got to do it scientifically. So I say, bugger that. Now, there's then a move to get rid of 5.9, because everybody in contest gives everybody 5.9. So they say, why do that? It's a waste of time. And I say, please keep it. Because my ears hear 5.9, they don't register that. All they register is listen very carefully because the next bit's important. So it's like a, a pre-trigger for the brain. Now, that's why it's better to send 59123, which is the numbers of the thing for the contest, than to send 59595923123123. Because the brain is going, what is all this? In fact, don't repeat anything unless it's requested. Yes, I know I'm a bit of a hypocrite on that sometimes, but 
That should be your general rule. Don't repeat unless requested. What kind of station do you want? Set your radio budget. How much money have I got? You don't have to be rich. Just what you've got. Then spend most of it on antennas. <laughs> the vast bulk of it on antennas. 90% on antennas. Nearly all the transceivers made in the past few decades are quite capable. There's better ones or worse ones, but they're all more or less capable of doing the job. And you can get some of the very flashy ones on the second hand market for a real bargain. Don't over modulate or process the audio. Clean, clear, crisp audio is what you need. On CW, same thing. Make sure the signal's clean and don't send faster than you can receive. I take particular delight if I'm not really being serious in a contest. They send at 45 words a minute and they expect you to sit there, you know. So what I do is I go back to them at 40 words a minute. And it's amazing how many of them say, uh, uh, VK, repeat, please. So I then up it to 45 and mess them about a bit. Um, interface the radio to the log. Pretty important. It's so easy to forget to change the band when you change the band on the radio. Let the radio tell the computer to change the band in the log. Okay, log checking. You've entered your log in Cabrillo format. It's a lovely name, isn't it, Cabrillo? Anybody know where the Cabrillo comes from? The um, log checking software and the, the process for producing that input to the log checking software was written by Trey Gerlow. And Trey at the time was attending a technical college which was called the Cabrillo Technical College along Cabrillo Road in California. So that's how it got the name. Um, your entry will be acknowledged if you put an email in correctly. Deadlines have changed dramatically in recent years, so be very careful. It used to be like three months after the contest. It's now like a week. The log will then be analysed and compared with the logs of other entrants. Results will be an, in an email so that you can go and access what's happened to your log. Now your log will be test, uh, checked and you will get a report that tells you what are nil. That means you're not in the log. That, you, know, you say you were VK7GN but you're not in my log. Uh, bad call means that you claim to work VK7GM when you work me. And it's obvious because the times correlate when they do the log checking. Um, a uniques are where nobody else has worked them in the contest. So there's some level of uniques everybody works. They work their mate down the road and this sort of thing. So it's not a big deal. And, and mostly you're not penalised for it. It is sometimes an excuse used for penalising somebody who really has cheated in a way that uh, nobody really wants to accuse them of cheating, but they do feel it would be good if they were chucked out of the results. Um, time or ban violations apply to some of the multi-operator uh, multi, uh, uh, stations. Stations who got your call wrong and stations who got your report wrong. And that is worth analysing. When you get that report, it's worth analysing. It, it uh, tells you an awful lot about what's going wrong in the communication between you and other people. Everyone makes mistakes, so you're all going to get errors. And the trick is to get to minimise the errors. Now, on phone, I can get my error rate down between 1% and 2%. On CW, I'm not telling you. <laughs> but it's terrible. Uh, mistakes in some contests re result in extra points being deducted. So beware of that. Study the reports and use them. That's my VK5GN station. And it's what is called single op 2 radio. What that means is that I've got two radios and I'm using both of them most of the time. So right in there, there's a, 
a, a little brass rod sticking up. If I put that in the middle, the left radio is on my left ear, right radio on my right ear. If I put it to the left, all the left radio is on both ears, right. And below it, there's a, a switch to do the microphone the same system. Now, what happens is that if I'm calling CQ on that, now you could just sit back and <laughs> let the computer call CQ for me, and I'll just have a bit of a rest. Well, you don't do that. You switch over onto that radio, and you look for multipliers. So you've got that. Say you're running on 20 meters on that one. You've got this one on 15 meters looking for multipliers. You've got two linears. They're both single tube linears. I try not to operate too far outside the, the rules. I've got a spare linear because they are the ones that mostly fail. Radios don't usually fail, but linears do. Here I've got switches which allow me to put any radio to any, sorry, any antenna to any radio. And the operating desk is actually on rollers, so you can pull it away. If a crisis occurs, you can get around the back. Okay. That's the station operating an RD contest. You won't find 5GN in RD contest results, but you will find VK5 Barossa Radio Club. And this is one of the club members operating my HF rig. And it's another club member. We set up this as a VHF UHF entry. Oh, note the comfortable chair and the air conditioner. RD contest is mainly what I call a run contest. There's not a lot of point in tuning around. Just find a clear frequency and bang away. Um, with the three hour periods, it's even more of a CQ contest. Uh, in the olden days, when it wasn't three hours, you would run out of stations to work, so you'd have to go tuning around and looking for any fresh meat that came up on the band and grab it quick. Plan to be on the high point bands of 160 and 23 centimeters and up. Plan the night time for triple points. Um, there's three hour blocks, so you can make it so you get a little bit of sleep in the middle. Uh, Move people for multiple points. It's not usually worth moving one person for one point. Uh, the logs for RD are N1MM, but it only works on HF. The VKCL is probably the better one. It's the one I use. Uh, and 5DJ, I haven't looked at it lately, but he has one as well. If you're not calling CQ or calling a station, you are not scoring points. There's the log views. This is the VKCL. That's the N1MM. Uh, how am I going on time, Justin? That's good. Uh, Sorry? So, uh, this, this is the VKCL. If you haven't used it before, it's not, it's not difficult to use. Having downloaded VKCL from the site, I've got a handout here which has got URLs on it which you can look up. Uh, first thing to do is to put your call sign in, obviously. The operator's call sign. And then that will allow you to select the contest and select what category you're going to go in. OmniRig is a system for communicating between the radio and the, the program. Um, it, it works for a vast range of, of, of rigs. Uh, but you have to first download the OmniRig program itself. Again, that's listed in the handout. But having set up your radio, then you can move on to uh, save that configuration and go into the logging program. The logging window will up here would be if I'd done that OmniLog. It would have a list of the bands that you, you could be operating on. To to do the things you're in a contest, all you do is put the call sign in there, put the exchange received in there, and any name that somebody might give you in there, and then just hit log the queue, sir. That's it. And it will tell you when 
you can work that again in the next three hour period. So the, the log will be telling you that. Make sure that your computer and the time is set to agree. My computers tend to be set to GMT. Saves, saves me thinking. Um, if I need to know what the local time is, I'll look up my watch. <laughs> so it's as simple as that to operate the, uh, the contest. Some of the stuff I've, I've put on this handout, there's a couple of, um, couple of YouTube things. First one is, it's called Little, Pistol, Little Pistol's Bigger Score, which is a, an excellent um, speech by an American operator about operating a small station. By contrast, the next one is a K3LR Multi Multi Contest Station Tour. If any of you have not seen K3LR Station, please get that on YouTube and watch it. This guy has got probably the most professional amateur radio station in the world. Uh, they have towers that go up to 275 feet. They have an operating position for every band. And on each band, they have two transceivers, one for chasing multipliers and one for running. Those two transceivers are both ICOM 7851s. So in that station, there are, what's six times two? 12, 12 ICOM 7851s. Now this is a $10,000, $12,000 radio. So then there is a, each of those radios has its own linear, limited to American 1500 watt power. It doesn't run excess power up there. They're monoband linears with their own power supply, homemade. Um, and listening to, to Tim describe his station and talk about his station, listen to him saying things like, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursdays, the antenna crew come in. <laughs> now this is every Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. It takes a bit of maintenance to look after all that aluminium. And then he talks about, in his bucket list, is to have a stacked 80 meter beam. He's got a dipole currently at 275 feet, and he's got heaps of vertical array stuff, but he wants. And they, they have tried before, I know they've tried before, and it didn't last very long. It lasted about as long as the 160 meter beam did in uh, Finland. Don't know whether you ever heard of that one three element beam on 160 meters. It was huge. And it was well designed and well engineered, but not enough. It fell down. Um, but have a look at have a look at Tim's station. It really is it and he they can get on 80 meters, they can operate the two stations within eight KCs of each other. So you can have a station calling CQ on one frequency, and eight KCs up, you could be working a multiplier. And he talks a little bit about how he achieves that, what it means to, to filter out all the noise and the rubbish that's in your in your station. Um, I've got uh, a reference to a thing called Contest University, which is an American. It's run during Dayton and various conventions. Uh, but there's some excellent files in there. Just go in and have a look if you want to find out more about logging. VK Contest Log, the Omni Rig, N1MM, and some other stuff on there. If you have any problem with any of it, just give me a call and I'll be quite happy. Or if you have trouble getting your rig to work with, uh, with VKCL or, or any other logging program, just give me a call and I'll help you find sort it out. So that's HF Contesting in a nutshell. It's supposed to be fun. I mean, I have found it's fun. I've also found that when I was in a very high stress job, 
if I was operating one of these things, I was focused on radio. And all the stress of the work just went out that window. And so it was very good for me. Um, now I'm older, I can't do all these things. I, I can't stay up all night any longer. <laughs> I just start falling asleep. I did fall asleep once years and years and years ago on one contest and I must have been either hitting or holding the CQ key. <laughs> and Tina um, S50A sat on the frequency calling me until I woke up. They said, oh good, you've woken up at last, have you? <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> Uh, the other joke one I talk about practice, you can practice this stuff, particularly on CW. There's lots of programs for it. And I was operating one of these things, which is a, a contest. You feel like you're operating in a contest. And Linda called me for dinner. And I'm sitting there operating my little contest. And I said, yeah, 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 I've got a run going here. She said, you do know it's only a program, don't you? <laughs> oh, yeah, OK. <laughs> anyway, any questions? That's good. Is that two, is that two uh, radio set up a different class of, in the competition? SO2R. When you, you tell it's a different, different class. Um, no, that's single operator. Two radio is standard single operator, right. uh, but you will be multi-band. Sure. So you'll be single op, multi-band, all band. Um, but no, it's not a separate category. And some people can do it and some people can't. I can do it on phone. I can do a little bit on CW, but I can't do it very well on CW. That Omni-Rig software, does that work for all, any radio or does that work for certain types of radios? Most of the standard stuff like ICOM transceivers or Yasha transceivers or whatever, that sort of stuff. Anything in the last 20 odd years probably? Yeah, more or less. Yep. More or less. I, I think there's a few very recent ones that maybe it still hasn't quite incorporated, but most of them are using a standard, you know, Yasha have pretty well standard standardised what they're stuff is. ICOM have pretty much standardised what it is. So even if there isn't a specific radio, you can try one of the other ones. Any other questions? Otherwise I shall hand it over to Dickie. Show our appreciation, please.